finish is that? Whenever you're ready. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Shall we go then? Okay, just back up just in case my recording fails. Okay, so um, I think everyone here knows me, hopefully. I'm Le Piao Lin. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Bitcoin and blockchain. And this is um, a lecture that I gave in my 421 class. And I figured that maybe it might be useful for some of you. Um, okay, quick poll. Who here uh, know how blockchain works? And uh, know how Bitcoin works? <laughs> okay, I see a couple of hands. Um, Okay, that's good. That, that just will give me a sense of how much, how fast I should go. Um, well, first thing is that, um, you know, when I first read the Bitcoin paper, I didn't understand it. Um, so it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's not something you can understand in just one sitting. And it really took me multiple days of going through documentation before I finally realized how how Bitcoin works. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping to so sort of give you uh, give you guys a jump start, if you will. Hopefully, I can convey the main me mechanisms across in 45 minutes. All right. So this will be this will be interesting. Um, so I this will be from a distributed systems perspective. I'm not going into the crypto and security and trust aspects. I'm not going into the economic aspects. So it's mostly a systems, so computer science, distributed systems point of view. All right? Okay, so with that, let's go. Um, why should you be interested in Bitcoin? Well, there is a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of press. Some people think that blockchain is going to change the world, um, the whole Bitcoin technology. And just recently, in fact, um, the state legislature has actually passed a bill. Uh, I think they're close to passing a bill, not quite passed yet, but it's in its final stages. Uh, that, that's going to establish a working group to study the uses of uh, blockchain technology within the government. So this is pretty big, and it's, it's, this is sort of surprising because governments usually tend to be more uh, conservative and risk averse, and this is still somewhat cutting edge technology. So uh, another reason is that Bitcoin is getting, uh, it's getting accepted by quite a few online um, merchants, right? Uh, Overstock.com accept Bitcoin, Expedia, the travel website they accept Bitcoin too. So you can you can actually use Bitcoin to buy stuff and buy services, right? Um, there are also Bitcoin exchanges where you can exchange it to, to other currencies and this is just uh, some of them. And uh, that means that you can actually buy Bitcoin and sell Bitcoins, right? Crazy. Um, this is just some terminology that are like denominations in Bitcoin, milli Bitcoin, micro Bitcoin. The one that's probably most often used as Satoshis, and that's sort of named after the, um, uh, the person who wrote the paper and who came up with, the, with, with Bitcoin itself. Okay, uh, before I explain uh, how Bitcoin works, I'm gonna quickly go through a couple of basic concepts. Okay, some of this should be very familiar to some of you, or maybe not, we'll see. So we'll quickly go over some uh, concepts. Well, first is sort of the, the P2P stuff. Right, uh, there's a concept in, in P2P called overlay networking, and uh, some of you may be familiar, some of you may not be familiar. This is where um, the application itself keeps track of identities of nodes and the IP addresses, um, and the application takes care of routing messages to these peers, right? Um, and so this overlay network is basically the peers, when you say peers, we really mean the application itself, doing both naming and routing at the application level, right? Then the IP level, right, the, your, your, your regular networking stack just becomes the low level transport, all right? Um, so basically, for example, um, this node B, right, if it has a P2P app, 
the app is going to maintain a routing table with IP addresses to possibly its neighbors, for example, A and C, or possibly more. All right. Um, some of you uh, may remember <coughs> that there was an app called Napster, and then there were other uh, variants that came out after that, right? Uh, Nutella and uh, Hazard, I think. Right? Remember those days? Right? So that was based on the P2P mo model. Right? And essentially, they, they do some variant of uh, P2P search, which uh, basically it floods your query on the overlay network. Right? So if, if this is, this is your, your client and you're trying to search uh, for particular MP3 files, Right, you would you would flood the query. Say who who has who has X Y Z dot MP three, right to your neighbors, and your neighbors will do the same. You will actually forward your search along, right, and finally your search reaches the guy who actually has the file, and he's going to send the file to you, right, or you're going to download it from uh, from this node. All right, so this is the notion of P two P overlay networks and how how searching works, right. Um, later on, they improved upon that. Um, they have these uh, ultra peers, right? Basically, a, an ultra peer sort of work on behalf of a whole bunch of smaller peers, if you will, right? And there are different ways where ultra peers can be elected and so on, and selected and so on. Uh, the other concept that you're going to need is data replication. This is the idea that. For the same piece of data, I'm going to replicate it many, many times. Right? In the case of Bitcoin, I'm going to replicate the same piece of data in every node. Okay? In every node. Right? So it means that every node in the network, right, or in the network of peers, is going to contain a copy of the data. Okay? Uh, now, in Databases and distributed systems, one of the problems when you have data replication is how do you keep replicates, the replicas up to date? Or how do you keep them in sync? Right? Because you have multiple copies of, of, uh, of the data. Right? Um, databases traditionally use ACID transactions. If you call what ACID, A stands for atomic, C stands for consistent, I stands for isolation, D stands for durability. Um, as it means that once the transaction is done, all your replicas are in sync, right? Um, that's not the case for most P2P uh, systems, right? They don't rely on asset consistency, they rely on eventual consistency. It means that it's possible for some of your replicas to be out of sync, okay? And ho hopefully, eventually, given enough time, the replicas will all sync up and be consistent. All right. So, for example, if if your if your client at B or your peer at B updates a piece of data, right? How do that? How does that update get propagated to the rest of the cost copies, right? So that's always a key pro problem in replication. Okay. So that's replication. Uh, next thing will be digital signatures. Again, I think this this crowd most of you should know. Right, it's a method to ensure the following properties on messages. Right, authentication proves who the sender is. Uh, Non-repudiation -repu proves that the message is from the sender. Integrity proves that the message has not been tampered with. Right, and typically we use um, some form of a. Um, there's basically three operations: right, key generation, where you generate keys. Signing, the sender signs a message with his or her private key. Verification, the, uh, using the sender's public key, the receiver can actually verify the message. Okay. Um, very quickly, um, key generation, if you have used uh, a key generation algorithm like, like, like SSH keygen, which most of you should have, I think, uh, it generates two files, right? one containing a public key, one containing a private key. In general, your private key should be kept secret. You never share your private keys. Uh, the public key is something that you can give out and share with other people. All right? 
Uh, this is an example of a key pair that I generated just for fun, just to show you with SSH key gen. Right? It doesn't look very pretty, and you can't make much sense out of it, because it's supposed to be random anyway. Right? OK, so uh, the, two, uh, the two operations are signing. Right, so you, you're going to use your public key to sign a message, right? and that generates a signature. Right? You often would send the signature along with your message to the receiver. The receiver then would take your public key, the message, and the signature, and there will be another piece of algorithm that would actually do the verification and say, yes, this message is all good, all kosher, and all it says no. Right? Um, now, actually, anyone having these three pieces of information can do the verification, not, not just the receiver. Okay, anyone can do the, the, the verification. Another tiny detail that uh, I need to talk about is that often, especially in the case of Bitcoin, we, you may not sign the whole message. Often, you will apply a cryptographic hash of the message first, and then you apply the signature on the hash of the message. Okay? It's just common practices. What is that gain? Sorry? What is that gain? Um, it's faster. Yeah. Because the message could be big, the, the cryptographic hash sort of shrinks it down, and then you do the signing on that much smaller bit string. Um, but again, I'm not the expert on this one. We, we should talk to our colleagues doing security. Uh, quick, one quick slide on cryptographic hash function. Uh, it's a hash function that takes a message and shrinks it down to a fixed size di digest. Well, often called digest, right? We just call it hash. Five main properties. It has to be deterministic. So same message, same hash. Uh, quick to compute. Uh, infeasible to generate a message from its hash value means the inverse is hard, difficult, and ideally a small change in the message should generate a big change in the hash value. Okay. Should be infeasible to find two different messages with the same hash value, or very difficult, very expensive. That said, I think sometime last week there was an announcement that um, Google, in collaboration with some folks, have broken the SHA-1 hashing function that's often used in uh, the older web browsers and a bunch of internet systems. All right, um, so you can read about this, uh, just Google it. But they basically found a way to construct two PDF documents that looks different that would actually generate the same hash value. Okay, so anyway, I'm not gonna talk about this. Uh, okay, so now we actually, so that was all, all, the, all the basic stuff, the basic concepts. Now we can talk about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to spend maybe 20 minutes doing an overview, and then maybe another 15, 20 minutes going into a deeper dive. All right? Uh, okay, so Bitcoin, it's a cryptocurrency and mm -hmm. payment system. It was invented uh, in 2008 by an anonymous person called Satoshi Nakamoto. I think in 2008 he released the white paper of the paper and in 2009 he released the code, the open source uh, application, right? And um, it's, uh, I believe it's the first cryptocurrency or digital currency. Uh, it's peer-to-peer, uh, it's -peer, right? So there's no centralized authority um, as we saw earlier, it can be used to exchange for real money, right? And now it can be used to, like, to buy both virtual and real goods and, and services, right? Uh, by the way, so this is the value of Bitcoins uh, in USDs over the past one year, right? From February 21st, 2016 to uh, February 21st, 2017. And you could see that it went from about $400 all the way to it's close to a thousand bucks now. Right? Yeah. So, uh, which also means that if you if you had had the uh, the foresight of buying some bitcoins here, 
and selling it today, you probably made a ton of money. <laughs> okay, uh, just for fun. Okay, Bitcoin, right? Um, again, just to talk a little bit about uh, digital money, if you will, like digital currency, right? Uh, to function like real money, uh, the system somehow has to manage, um, has to figure out how much money you have, right? Uh, then it has to be enabled to transfer money from one person to another. Uh, and then the next one is sort of something that's more unique to, to digital currency is that it has to ensure no double spending, right? Meaning that um, that's not such a big problem in, in, in the physical one because the physical one, you have a physical coin or a physical note and you could only use that, right? You, once, you, once you pay for it, it's gone, it's out of your hands, right? But digital is not, is, is a bit more tricky than that. Right, so one instance of a coin can only belong to one user at any one time. Right, we have to enforce that somehow. Right. Um, in fact, if you think about it, you don't really uh, care about the first case that much. All you really care about is transfers. Right, because the transfers determine how much money you have. Right. Because if you think about it, right, you, I mean, when you were born, you didn't have any money. At some point, maybe, maybe your parents gave you some. Otherwise, maybe you got a job and you work for an employer, your employer paid you money, so that's a transfer, right? And then when you spend money to buy goods and services, that's another transfer. So in fact, um, basic transfers, the notion of transfers captures all that you need in the system. Account balance can be calculated if you have a whole history of transfers. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so, thinking more about transfer, right? If you if, if it's a, if it's a, if it's real currency, it's it's pretty easy. You just give the person a note, or coins, or gold, or silver, right? Uh, if you go electronic, right? As it is today, suppose user A and user B both have accounts at the same bank. It's also very easy, right? You, 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 you authorize your bank to pay user B some amount of money, and it can be done. Um, even if they do not have accounts at the same bank, you can do interbank transfers. You just have the two banks to talk to each, each other, and the transfer can be done, right? But this model requires a some form of central authority. Right, and manages your money. So the, the, the bank is the, is the middleman. Right? There's no easy way to sort of transfer money between user A and user B without going through a bank. And that's one of the things that uh, Bitcoin tries to solve. It's saying that, well, instead of a bank, I'm going to have the Bitcoin P2P system. Right? And you just have to authorize the transfer Right, the Bitcoin P2P system will record the transaction transferring the money from A to B. Right? And once that transaction is done, okay, in database terms committed, then um, the, the payee can check to see if that payment went through. Okay? So that's what the uh, Bitcoin P2P system is actually trying to do. Right, now, how, how does it do that? Uh, let's take a quick look at uh, Bitcoin transactions. This is sort of a, uh, a diagram of several Bitcoin transactions. Um, we have transaction zero, for example. Uh, but by the way, the true transaction zero is called the Genesis transaction, or Genesis block. And that's like um, way when Bitcoin first, first started. Uh, but let's just not worry too much about the numbering. But transaction zero, it has each transaction has inputs and outputs, right? Inputs means money coming in, outputs mean going out, right? So um, using tr transaction zero, you can you the outputs can um, can be used to spend in transaction one. So transaction one spends forty thousand from output zero. Uh, of transaction zero and transaction two spends uh, fifty thousand from output one of transaction zero. 
Okay? Um, so the transactions get linked up this way. Okay? I'll just stare at it for, for a moment. Um, so outputs that have not been spent, that gets accrued in your balance from your wallet, if you will. Okay? And those is called um, unspent transaction output or UTXO. Okay. Now, in terms of the um, payer and payee, the way it works is that each owner transfers the coin to the next by signing a hash of the previous transaction. That's how he got the coin in the first place, right? The transaction that transferred the coin to him. Um, and the public key of the next owner, right? And adding this to the end of the coin, all right? Um, so it's easier to look at this 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 middle one, right? Um, so the uh, let's see, this is this is this is the this is the new owner. This is this is this is the payee. This is the new owner, right? Uh, you need the new owner's public key. That's the person you're trying to pay. His public key. You need a hash of the previous transaction, and you take that and you um, hash it. And you generate a, and then you you generate a signature uh, using owner one. Owner one is going to this this a payer. The payer is going to uh, sign this transaction, saying I'm I'm authorizing uh, this this amount to be paid to owner two, for example, right? Um, and of course, this signature you can anyone can verify because. You, you, you can get hold of owner's one public key, you can verify this signature and therefore this, this transaction. Okay? So this chaining of transactions is um, how it works in terms of these signatures. Okay, that was transactions, and then transactions get, um, get stored in a what's called a blockchain. All right? um, the way to think of this is that a blockchain is a distributed P2P, replicated, and public database. Sometimes they call it a ledger. It's an append-only only database. You all can only append information to it. Um, you, cannot, you cannot delete. You cannot update. Okay. Um, so it's a ledger of transactions from the beginning of the Bitcoin system. Right, so it has the entire history, all right, of all transactions that ever occurred since the first day that Bitcoin was started. All right, um, consensus among the P2P nodes are achieved using uh, a proof of work system. We'll talk more about that. It's basically a uh, a way to hash the blocks, and it's computationally expensive. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So the idea is that uh, I'm going to group transactions, group a bunch of transactions into a block, right? Um, and then I'm going to chain the blocks together, all right? So transactions get grouped into a block, um, and then each block gets hashed. Okay, let, let's use this one because it's a chain, right? So transactions get, get grouped into a block. And it gets hashed together with the hash of the previous block. Okay? And then so the hash of this block gets hashed with the next block and so on. So in that way it's chained together. Alright, that's why they call it a blockchain. Alright? And uh, <coughs> blocks that have been hashed are broadcasted into the P2P network so that every uh, node. Uh, keeps a copy and adds it to their blockchain. And remember I said we, we did replication earlier, the reason is that every node has a replicated copy of the blockchain. Right? And ideally, in the ideal world, every, every node should have the same identical copies of the blockchain. Um, but because it's a P2P system, there's no uh, strong way to guarantee that. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in a way. So the blockchain basically is authoritative history of all the transactions. Okay. 
Okay, uh, to, to go in a little bit deeper, um, you talk about three types of nodes. There are three types of nodes in, in Bitcoin P2P system. You have the mining nodes on the miners. These take care of hashing the blocks. You have the peer nodes, which relay and store transaction and also stores the blockchain. There are the wallet nodes. These are the, the more lightweight ones that actually per, they do perform an uh, important function. They store and release funds. They manage keys. Right? And wallet nodes, uh, these programs exist on multiple platforms. You can have a wallet node on your iPhone and your smartphones. So you can use your smartphones as a, uh, as a payment device. Right? You can use it to send payments and receive payments using, using the wallet nodes. Okay, so in general, the wallet nodes, if you want to pay somebody, it's going to generate a transaction that gets forwarded to the peer nodes. Peer nodes um, will then, um, again, the transactions go from the peer nodes to the mining nodes. The mining nodes aggregates the transactions, uh, mines them uh, into blocks, and the blocks go into the blockchain. Yeah. It's yes. probably worth saying every peer node has all the capabilities of a wallet, and every miner has all the capabilities of a peer node. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Good point, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, so every, so think of these as more, more roles uh, rather than actual uh, programs because the, the mining nodes would actually often have um, all the capabilities of, of, of the PNO. Uh, in fact, that's, that's, that's the case actually. Uh, so let's keep going. A mining node, what does it do? It, it, it gets new transactions from the Bitcoin P2P system, right? Packages transaction into blocks, compute the proof of work, which is a cryptographic hash that meets a certain target threshold criteria, right, on the block. Um, adds the block to the blockchain by block by broadcasting the block with the hash. Okay. Now, um, in order to reward the mining nodes for doing this, because computing the proof of work is actually pretty difficult. The mining node gets rewarded, or the person running the mining node gets rewarded with a Bitcoin. All right. um, this, is, this is the original uh, intention. Uh, later they, they sort of uh, uh, change it to also, you can actually also receive a transaction fee. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but this is how Bitcoins get created. Okay, uh, bitcoins get created when you compute a cryptographic hash of a block of transactions, and that block of transactions, if it gets successfully added to the blockchain, you get a bitcoin. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? You guys should start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, you can make money, right? For one bitcoin is what twelve hundred bucks. Not bad. <laughs> okay, a wallet node. Um, like I said, it, it generates generates private keys, uh, derives corresponding public keys. It helps to distribute the public keys as necessary. Monitors the blockchain for outputs that have been spent to those public keys. Um, creates and signs transactions spending those outputs. Uh, broadcast the signed transactions. Okay, I think this one is fairly straightforward. Um, the more interesting one is, uh, well, we'll talk about those later, but when is a transaction committed? Okay. Um, after a transaction is broadcast, right, um, the mining nodes will try to incorporate the transaction into a block, into the blockchain. Now think of it, it's a P2P system, right? You have multiple peers all working locally Right, uh, with no explicit synchronization between peers or mining nodes, other than the broadcast messages. Okay, so everything is up for grabs. Different mining nodes will try to grab a bunch of transactions and try to do the mining and try to put them in, in, into a block. Okay, 
And so it's possible that the blockchain can diverge. So in fact, it's not really a chain, it's more like a tree, to some degree, strictly speaking, right? So um, how does the system handle this, right? Um, it has a rule that says that the longest chain always wins, right? So given enough time, right? Given enough time, like at some point, this block that it might diverge. There were two blocks that got attached to, to, to this block. But hopefully, given enough time, some other mining nodes is going to attach another block to this block first. And another mining node is going to attach the block here. And very soon, this node gets, um, gets orphaned. Right? It doesn't, no other nodes try to, try to attach to this block anymore. Right, because every node is working on this this heuristic, if you will. So I, I I always prefer the longest chain. Right, so after some time, when um, when enough blocks get added to this block, then I can then I can say that oh, most likely this block is going to win. Right, and that means that most likely this block will be permanent in the in the blockchain. And hence, at that point, I can say that, that the transaction in the block has been committed. Okay? So, um, um, may I yeah. Yes, please. So, actually, miners have an incentive to grow the longest chain because otherwise, whatever bitcoins they earn from mining the block it's will gone. get lost if another chain wins. Yes. Yeah, which means that the, 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 miner, the mining block who actually did the hash for, for this block, for example, Right, um, when it gets offered, means when everyone actually start growing this this chain instead, right? It, this this block gets thrown away. Let's put it this way: it gets thrown away, right? It's not part of the chain. It's not part of the chain, which means that the coin that you're supposed to earn from it is not recognized anymore. So, so the mining nodes have an incentive actually to, to try and uh, well mine nodes as quickly or mine blocks as quick, quickly as possible and try and attach to, to the most uh, to the block that's most promising right that's most likely to succeed. So what happens to the transactions and the unsuccessful ones? They all get rolled back. I mean, they all get aborted pretty much. They should get incorporated by the miner computing the next block. The idea is that yeah. your transaction got broadcast, so all the miners have it, and yeah. eventually they'll get in one of the blocks. Hopefully. <laughs> that, but maybe <laughs> most transactions are probably in both blocks. Yeah, it's possible for, for um, because again, it's, it's a P2P system. There's no, there's no um, strong synchronization mecha mechanism. So it's possible that these two blocks have, have overlapping tra transactions. It's totally possible. In fact, would be likely, right? Yes. Because it's broadcast everybody. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a very interesting system, actually. Right? Okay, what this means also is that uh, if, if there's an adversary that's trying to fudge data or fudge the transactions, right? If he needs to fudge this transaction, right, what it means is that he has to... Remember, this transaction contains a hash of the hash of this transaction, right? Through this chaining, if I fudge this, all the hash values is going to change, right? So if I, if I fudge this, to successfully fudge this and get away with it, I have to hash everything after it. Okay, so this is where, this is how it sort of discourages um, uh, fudging or trying to, to modify the data. Or find a collision, right? Sorry. Or find the collision. Or find the collision, yes. Which should be very hard, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but hard is always relative, right? It's <laughs> things change. Okay, uh, there's a general rule. This is not really um, for sure, but when more than six blocks have been attached to this block, then they consider this block to have been committed. Okay, in terms of the transaction. So the difficulty of computing a new block is adjusted periodically, so on average, 
the block is computed every 10 minutes. Yep. Thank you, Ada. Yeah. yeah. So that's after about an hour. <coughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So the um, you can look it up. There's there's a formula that they use to adjust the difficulty. It's like every 2016 transaction, it gets uh, blocks. It gets uh, adjusted according to a particular formula. So it's kind of well thought out, I must say. Um, uh, how do you prevent double spend? Um, double spend is when two transactions is trying to spend the same Bitcoin. If those two transactions succeed, then you have a double spend, right? Um, upon receiving transactions, all Bitcoin nodes, these are the peer nodes, are supposed to check the validity of the transaction against the transaction that is the source of the funds. And this is using the local blockchain. It's local replica of the blockchain. So um, uh, the, the peers will be checking the transactions and hopefully uh, that, should, that should stop any uh, double spends. But it's not guaranteed, it's not guaranteed, right? Because your, your local blockchain may be slightly out of date, right? There are, there are all these possibilities. Um, again, um, you, we, need, we do need to ensure that two concurrent transactions that are double stamped do not both succeed. And again, this is using the mechanism that we talked about earlier. It's like, at some point, right, um, there will be a tiebreaker as in um, someone will attach a block. So if there's a, if there's a double spend transaction um, X and Y and they're in these two different blocks, they will sort of mine concurrently and went up concurrently, then at some point, somebody is gonna attach one and sort of uh, break the tie, if you will. And these guys, this guy is gone. So you can never have X and Y in the same block because the mining node would prevent that. Right? Yes, yes. The, uh, uh, the peers itself will actually prevent that. So they will, they, will, they will not let you have that. But it's possible, remember, it's possible to have uh, two peers that have slightly different um, transactions in its memory. So this is when it's possible to have that in, in, in two, two different blocks. Yeah. Um, okay, now earlier on I said that a block stores a set of transactions. Um, it's not completely accurate. What happens is that uh, in reality, the set of transactions are compressed. Uh, what, do we, what do I mean by compressed? It's, it's compressed using a Merkle tree, which I'll explain in a bit, and only the tree root is stored in the block. Okay, what's a Merkle tree? Um, we have transactions. These are your these are your transactions, right? A Merkle tree is going to do this. It's going to hash whichever transaction. I'm going to denote the primes as as, the, as a hash function, uh, as a hash version of A, right? And I'm going to concatenate these two hash and hash them again, right? Concatenate these two hash, hash them again. Then concatenate these two hash and hash them again. Right until I get a until I get a, a single root. Right, turns out that if you have a uh, if you have a single branch, it will just concatenate with itself. All right, and then hash. Okay, um, and then only the root node, right? Only the root node is stored in the block. Okay, um, it should be clear to you, hopefully, uh, if not, you can sort of uh, think about it, that if I, if I have the root node and I want to verify a particular transaction, say transaction D, if I want to verify that D was added to the block, right, then um, I, I have the root node, what I need is, um, what I need is this, this value um, this value in order to compute this, um, this value in order to compute this, and then this value in, not, in order to compute the root node, and that way I can, so that's how I would check. So I wouldn't need to download some of the, uh, some of the other guys, like, 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 like this one, for example. Right. Okay, is that. so that's a Merkle tree. A uh, little bit about the Bitcoin P2P networking. Uh, what happens when you first start up your peer nodes, right? Uh, you first start up your peer nodes, you first run the program, it's like, who are my peers, right? Who are my neighbors? Um, the, 
the programs have hard-coded IP addresses to DNSC nodes, right? So once it, once it boots up, if you will, if it, if it starts up, it's going to uh, probe the DNSC nodes for full nodes that are accepting connections, okay? And so that's how uh, it's going to figure out who is in the P2P network, okay? Uh, and then once connected, your, the peer nodes will continuously provide you updates on IP addresses of other peer nodes. Um, and then, you know, the, by the way, the mining nodes can also use additional higher speed links um, to actually do the broadcast and block, block propagation. Um, and then when, you, when the peer node first boots up, if it boots up, if you're starting the node for the first time, it doesn't have a copy of the blockchain. So there's a mechanism, I'm not going to go through the details, there's a mechanism to download and validate all the blocks uh, in the entire blockchain. All right? And it's the same mechanism that it will use if it, if it, uh, if it you know, sometimes you, you shut off the computer for 24 hours and you re reboot it, then it has, a, it has a time lag, but it, it didn't have any updates, right? So it can also use the same mechanism to figure out um, all the blocks that have been added to the blockchain since since the last time I was up. Okay, um, this is as of Friday last week. Uh, there are six thousand nodes, according to this website, six thousand Bitcoin nodes uh, distributed all over. These these are just just nodes. We don't know which ones are, are mining nodes. Uh, these are just general nodes. So uh, I guess I guess a lot in Europe and a whole bunch in, in, in the US. Um, some in China. Uh, I, I believe, Ado, you said most of the mining nodes are in China? That's what I heard, that uh, the majority of mining nodes are currently in China. Yeah. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you would know. <laughs> uh, I did zoom in on this map. Apparently, there are four nodes on this island. So I'm not sure who's running them. Uh, but just sort of interesting stuff. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Go for it. So, um, so I actually had a mining node a couple of years ago. Um, I tried to run the GPU. And, but I was, under, I was under the impression that it's uh, continually getting more and more difficult to mine. So it's now to the point where typically the electricity to run the node is more than the value of the Bitcoins we'll get from it. That's why you're running on campus. <laughs> <laughs> and not in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, electricity is expensive. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, don't know. I started mining in 2008, actually. And back then, we joined mining pools, right? Yeah. Where we all mine together, yeah. and we get our share, right? So back then, when my like compute, my like the Celeron, ran it a mining pool, and I'll get like half a bitcoin every day. So we have bitcoin, so it's not bad. And then just a couple of years ago, maybe four years ago, my friend had the money. He's like, "Hey, Danny, I know you used to do this. Try it again." So we had two computer, no, three computers with four video cards each, and. We joined a mining pool that was several magnitudes larger than the one we started in 2008, or I started in 2008. And over the course of a week, I think we had like 10% of a coin. It <laughs> 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 wasn't even worth it at that point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I ran one GPU for a couple weeks and I barely got anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to compete the basic and FPGA people. Yeah. Uh, Okay, otherwise, I'm going to run through some of the details. Maybe I won't go through everything because we're, we're running short on time. If you want to leave a little bit of time for discussion. Uh, transactions uh, has inputs and outputs. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. I think most of you have got this from the previous. Um, uh, okay, there is, a, uh, there is this thing called a pub key and a, and a signature script. All right, um, the, uh, the, an output, a, uh, has a pub key script attached to it, all right? Uh, and anyone who can satisfy the conditions of the pub key script can spend the money, can spend the, the, uh, the satoshis, all right? Uh, and then the input, uh, the input has a signature script associated with it. The signature script provides the data parameters that will satisfy the pub key script. All right, so that's how uh, that's how you sort of uh, provide the 
the credentials that, that you're authorized to, to spend uh, the money in the output. Okay? Um, and so there, is, uh, there are transaction identifiers, and, um, and each output has an output index, which is just, a, it's just an array index in, in the data structure. Right? Uh, so let's quickly look at how Alice pays Bob using this particular method of, 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 of payment. Right? Um, so you have Bob's computer, and uh, he's, going to, he's going to, Bob is the payee, right? the person receiving the payment, right? He has got to give a hash of his public key, right? And the hash of his public key is pretty much um, Bob's, uh, or one of Bob's Bitcoin ad uh, address. That's how they identify uh, people or Bitcoin accounts, if you will, right? So the public key hash is given to Alice, uh, and Alice will then put a copy of that in, in the transaction that pays Bob, all right? Uh, and it uses this uh, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which I know nothing about, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but uh, you know, private keys are 256 bits, and I guess it's, 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 it does what it does. Um, and then uh, Alice would then broadcast the transaction, and it's added to the blockchain, and so on. Right? Uh, and if that output has not been spent, right, like I said, it's the, the network categorizes it as a UTXO, and the wallet software will then display it as a spendable balance. Right? When Bob wants to spend that money that he got from, from Alice, right, so he will need the, uh, the public key hash of the transaction. All right, of the transaction, remember the transaction, right? Um, and he's going to create an input that references um, the transaction one hash or, or the transaction ID, um, and then specify the, the specific output. But there might be multiple outputs in the previous one, so it could be output one, output two, and so on. Uh, and then he's going to put that in the input of the next transaction. And, then they, and, uh, and the input of the next transaction will have the signature script that satisfies the pubs, pub key script of, of that Alice put in the previous transaction. All right. Um, so the pub key and signature scripts is the mechanism that sort of authorizes the, uh, the payment. OK. Now into sort of more the protocol stuff. And this is sort of the interesting stuff. So peer nodes. When it receives a transaction, right, it first checks the validity of the transaction against a local copy of the blockchain. Very important. If it's not valid, it will not forward the that transaction, right? Um, if it's valid, it will cache the unconfirmed transaction. This is the term they use, unconfirmed transaction in memory. So it has a, it has a memory that will uh, cache all that. And then it will actually forward the transaction along to its peers, right? Uh, this means that uh, transactions or unconfirmed transactions that never got mined for whatever reasons, right, will tend to slowly disappear from uh, the machines or from memory because memory is volatile as uh, as you know peers restart or as as they purge uh, the transactions to make room for memory for the others, okay. Um, okay, this is how it works. And it, as when the peers receive a newly mined block, it will then check against the transaction in its memory in order to figure out which transactions can be purged from its memory. All right, so this is how transaction gets purged from its memory. Uh, mining nodes, it would request for transactions. Again, there's like two modes of mining. There's a pool mining and there's an individual mining, right? Um, and this is money for the solo mining. It will request the transactions from, uh, from a peer node. And then the peer node will send it a set of transactions. Uh, and it, the miner is gonna construct a block and the 80-byte 80, 80 header block. The header block is one with the, with the Merkle root, all right? Uh, it will then send the header and the target threshold to the 
ASIC. All right, ASIC is the um, specialized hardware with uh, application specific integrated circuits. Uh, these are the specialized specialized hardware that's used to do the mining or the computation of the hash. Okay, uh, and then so this is going to compute the hash. Assuming that it does it succeeds, then it's going to broadcast the new block and the header to the rest of the network. Right. Uh, miners get paid via a coin-based transaction that is inserted into the block, right? And then uh, this is for the proof of work, which I'll talk about in the next slide. The way this works is that there is a, what's called a nonce. Is that how you pronounce it? Nonce? It's a, it's, think of it as a, it's like a, a chunk of bits that is fungible in the block and um, what the mining does is that it tries to set these bits you can increment it if you want you can increment it from you know however many to however many um, uh, whatever number and for every bit pattern you're going to compute the hash and see if that hash meets certain criteria right um, the criteria um, do we understand it? It's, it's based on number of preceding zeros. If the hash contains a certain number of preceding zeros, uh, zeros then it meets the threshold. All right. Uh, so once that's computed, then the new blocks will be added. Um, and then like, uh, like what Edo said earlier, every, every 2016 blocks, that criteria, the number of preceding zeros get up. Get changed. Gets changed. Gets yes. uh, Reduced as well. Yeah. Gets changed. Yeah. All right. To basically increase the difficulty of um, of mining. Right. Uh, what this means is that the difficulty of the proof of work is what makes blocks scarce. Right. And um, what makes blocks scarce? Remember, blocks mining the blocks is how you create bitcoins, and that's how it makes creation of bitcoins scarce or hard, scarce. And um, again, going back to uh, Bitcoin as a currency, again, I don't know the economics of it, but remember that currency is or money is tied to something that's that's scarce. Because remember, right, bef before we had paper money, we, we had gold and silver, gold and silver coins. And why were they made of gold and silver? Because they were scarce. Because they were scarce, they were hard to get. And therefore, it's of value. So you, it's, it's, a good, uh, uh, it's a good thing to use it to trade, right? So in the same way, this is what makes Bitcoin scarce. And therefore, gives it kind of value, if you will, right? Um, and, and this relies on the difficulty of inverting that particular hash function, exactly. which is why it's important to have a cryptographic hash function. Yes. To start to invert. yes we have a, yeah. yeah. A function is difficult to invert. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, okay, peers on receiving a block will check the validity of the block against its local blockchain. Uh, if it's a valid block, it will add it to the local blockchain, right? Uh, and then it will forward it along, right? Again, there could be um, divergence, right? <coughs> I'm running out of time, okay. I'm, I think you guys know, you guys know this. Um, confirmation, again, it depends on how many blocks have been attached to the block, all right? And I guess six confirmations is roughly uh, the number that's being used. It's, there's no guarantee, right? Because it's always possible that uh, even with six confirmations, that uh, that block can get, that chain can get off often. It's, it's not impossible, all right? Putting it all together, I mean, it, why don't you sort of imagine right in your head, this P2P network, right? Multiple wallets all over the place, right? There are miners in that network. And you know, transactions are coming, right? One transaction's coming here, it gets broadcasted out, and, and so on. Another transaction's coming there, gets broadcasted, right? Then the miners start picking up transactions and, uh, uh, and mining them, and then sending up blocks, 
right? The other miner is going to do the same, um, picking up transactions, mining it, setting up blocks, and so on, right? Other than these broadcasts, there's no other uh, synchronization mechanism, okay? So you're going to sort of chew on that a little bit because it's kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> Mind boggling that it works. <laughs> um, but definitely, partly, uh, we have good network infrastructure. Right? Because, again, if you have network partitions, right, problems can occur. Your blockchain can actually diverge. Uh, okay, quickly, I'm going to skip that. Um, there was an incident called the Ethereum VAO hard fork incident where. Um, Again, you can read the details from that link, but uh, the, the short story is a transaction was successfully added to the blockchain. This is the Ethereum blockchain. It's not Bitcoin. It's a, uh, a follow-on system that I think is used for contracts as well as, as, as currency, I think. Uh, but a transaction was successfully added to the blockchain that stole funds from the DAO account, which is um, sort of the consortium that of the, the group that um, that manages the, the Ethereum project, I believe. No, it was an investment fund. Investment fund. Okay, okay, yeah. investment fund. Okay. And the contract was used to give the investors the ability to choose the projects in which to invest. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Which is fairly <laughs> mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, <it's> <laughs> But what happened was that a community of Ethereum users, or miners, engineered a hard fork to reverse or undo the, the illegal transaction. Now, if, if, you, if you have been following the whole blockchain thing, there's not supposed to be an undo button. <laughs> it's, it's a pen only. You can't change anything after that, right? So this, these guys engineered a hard fork means that it created another branch that somehow managed to get longer than the other branch, and so the other branch gets, gets thrown away, right? So there's a lot of interesting ethical decisions because it's like the blockchain was supposed to be immutable, right? And it's like if that's not true, then it's like, you know, contract agreements, one certain the blockchain was supposed to be final, no, it may not be. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, sorry I went over time, but lots to think about. Uh, this is something that IBM is doing with Musk, with uh, supposedly setting up blockchain to store um, all the shipping uh, data in containers. Um, supposedly the peers, the, uh, the ports will be running peer nodes, the, uh, the shipping companies will be running peer nodes, um, and I guess mining nodes, I would guess. Um, I don't well, have the details. If I may add to that, the, the um, transactions include a small bit of code in a specialized language. And they also, they can spend less than the inputs. Yeah. Anything they spend less than the inputs goes to the miner when it's included in the block. And so you can actually pay to have some information incorporated into the blockchain. You don't have to actually spend that transaction. You can just use it for the information. And it's supposed to be immutable, but then the question <laughs> is, it's immutable until a large part of the commun community decides to mutate it. <laughs> so it's kind of confusing. <laughs> it is confusing. So the Federal Reserve analog. <laughs> well, there's no central authority unless you consider the coders to be the central authority. The central authority is the person with more than half the mining node. <laughs> if there is such a person, yes. If you can own half the mining nodes, or you, if you can hack into half the mining, more than half the mining nodes and take control of them, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, there's only six thousand of them, right? It's not, That's true. It's not that hard. I to mean, yeah, that the DDoS attacks with more than that number, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> actually, if you can DDoS more than half of the, the mining nodes, you can transfer control. That's to true. Half. <laughs> so, since you have this huge blockchain over time, does that add? make things computation more expensive to use this idea? It does. <laughs> so your, your database grows, but the actual computation is the same because you're computing on the hash. Right. 
that's what the Merkle tree is all about. Yeah. Don't so have to compute I think, all the original. I think they missed about what? Checking the blockchain. You're going to check the whole history. Yeah, you have to find transactions and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, of course, in this case, with the Bitcoin case, right, um, once the transactions have been spent, they kind of can be ignored. Archived, maybe is a better word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Real quick. Um, yep. So, yeah, because it's constantly getting more and more difficult to, to get more Bitcoins, what happens when people just eventually stop trying because it's difficult and it's not worth it anymore? Good question. Yeah. You know, it depends on the exchange rate graph that I showed. <laughs> <laughs> if the if the if the rate is high enough, you know, there's a price for everything. That's true. But if if miners stop mining, then the difficulty decreases. Oh, I see. Right. right. So so because transactions constantly true. have to yeah. be added, yeah. so somebody has to do it. That's interesting. Hmm. Can the miners collude and stop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with the tree, would it get more and more expensive to check a transaction over time? It will. So at some point, won't that be excessive? Yeah, but you know, you can always argue that. Um, I can I can construct indexes over over the over the blockchain. Um, that way, I can try and speed up some of the searches. Yeah. So the the mind boggling part of this uh, gets my attention. So it seems like this this system has a whole lot of it's pretty elaborate. Yeah. And that you had to basically hatch it all at once to get it to work. And so, has there been any incremental evolution of the system since it was released, or is it basically what was released is it, it's frozen in that? Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not frozen. There have been some incremental uh, changes. Uh, it's it's kind of clever. Okay, they kind of engineered some version numbers into it, and um, so that they they do allow for some mm -hmm. changes in the consensus rules and stuff like that. Yes, they do. One change that I know of is I believe the programming language when it first started was a little more powerful, and then they found some instructions were not very safe, and so they hmm. blocked them, but only after a certain block number. Right? So different rules apply early on versus later blocks. But the nice thing is it's got the built-in timestamp. Yeah, just something I didn't mention, but yeah. So what has caused the exchange rate to dramatically change over the last year is that is that governed purely by some sort of you know market forces that would be difficult to explain or is that something um, that they you know is controlled in a more centralized way how these bitcoins get no it's it the whole philosophy of the bitcoin is it's meant to be totally p2p no central control um, you know no government owns all the servers if you will or all the nodes so it's supposed to be totally deregulated, if you will. So I mean, is it sort of arbitrary just who decides how much they feel like paying for a Bitcoin? Uh, it's a good question. I think it's basically market forces. It's like I think most of it's the to the black market, right? And so yeah. market that's pretty much where the majority of those Bitcoins they circulate. Yeah, you can. Because you as a as a as something that aspires to be a currency. 300% deflation over a year yeah. seems kind of concerning, right? It is. <laughs> you're an investor, but as a currency, that's probably not what you want. Yeah. Well, it initially, initially spiked, it went up like 10,000% in, in, in like less than a year, right? So. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. Uh, they, people have been thinking that, that this is the thing that's going to solve like uh, some of the developing nations where they don't have a strong banking system and a strong uh, monetary system that this will allow, say, farmers to pay for stuff, or you know, or I mean, like uh, distributors to, to to pay farmers to buy crops from them and stuff like that. I don't know how true that is. <laughs> so yeah. you have to wait the six uh, thing or how long you want to wait. It takes about an hour, so yeah. 
you have to then wait for an hour before you hand out physical goods to make sure that you actually got it. Pretty much, point. pretty much, because that's 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 how long it takes to mm. have some reasonable assurance that the transaction is in the blockchain. Yeah. So it's mm. not. Yeah. So 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 that that has been one criticism, right? That that it's not clear that this can scale to the high transaction rates that we we are seeing with the use of traditional database technology, for example. So to elaborate a bit on that, you, uh, if you trust the person giving you the bitcoins, you don't have to wait at all. Yeah. Um, but the other, at the other extreme, there's no guarantee that you'll have six confirmations within an hour, right? Some could take longer. They could take 20 minutes each, and then you're still there after two hours. So. Yeah. Okay, I think we're out of time, I believe, right? Um, there's one online question, uh, Patrick Karjala. I've heard that there has been a fork of Bitcoin proposed in the past. What are the implications of that? A fork of Bitcoin? Yeah, have you heard that? No, I've, uh, beyond my knowledge, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, very much. thank you guys. <laughs>